Good morning, First Calvary. This is Sister Mavis Yarn with some announcements. I hope everything is going well and that you're safe and you're enjoying your summer. The first announcement is our back to school event, which will be held on September 4th from noon to 3 p.m. We'll be giving out our annual school supplies to children within the community as well as First Calvary children. Um, again, from noon to 3 p.m., um, there will be a cotton candy machine, possibly COVID testing. Um, we know that many of our kids have already started, but majority of our kids in New York City public schools, they start on the 13th. We're asking that you pray for all the children, the school staff, and the school itself. Um, we know that there are going to be many challenges because many of our children cannot be vaccinated. But again, we're just hoping they're excited and we're excited about school reopening. The next thing is about um, our Sunday school. So Sunday school will resume the same way. Um, we're not having any in-person um, Sunday school. Um, if you're on the Zoom, continue on the Zoom. If you're on the prayer line, continue on the prayer line. The only change is the time. We're starting Sunday school from 8.30 to 9.30. We're asking teachers for you to um, begin your class promptly and end it promptly. So this way it will give people time to be able to make it to uh, the morning service. So remember, no in-person Sunday school as of yet. Continue to have Sunday school the way that you do, either on the Zoom or on the prayer line which is September 5th. Yay, we are reopening. Service will begin at 1130. You can come by the church. The church should be open at 11 to arrive. We ask that you please have on your mask and socially distance. And please follow the direction of our ushers and our hospitality ministry. There's a couple things that I need to let you know beforehand. Some kind of like non-negotiable. So the first thing is that um, you must wear a mask. Although we will have masks available if you don't have a mask. But we ask for you to please have on your mask. Your children have on a mask. Um, that's a non-negotiable on the premises of the church, inside the church, we're asking for that. Another thing is that we're asking that you please refrain from um, physically embracing and touching. Um, I know we are excited about seeing people, but we just know that this is this this disease, this virus is all about contact, human contact. So if you see somebody, just wave to them, blow a kiss, do the Obama bump, the elbow bump. That's what we ask that you do. Limit that. Please do not do any of that, you know, hugging and things of that nature. There's no food or beverages, of course, eating um, within the church. So one of the non-negotiables, you know, you have to have a mask. So wear a mask and your mask should be um, on you at all times when you're in um, the sanctuary. Another thing is we will have temperature checks. That will be done before you enter the church. Of course, if you have a temperature, you know that you cannot enter. Another thing is that we will have to answer the health screening questions. We all know what those are. Um, they ask these questions about COVID. Please note that if you answer yes to any of these questions, you know you will not be able to enter. Also, they will be um, asking for your vaccination cards um, information, which will be stored um, in like a database for the church. Again, you can bring the card. Some of us have it on that Excelsior app. That will be acceptable. This is a one-shot kind of thing. You will not have to bring it every Sunday once they get that information. You know, that's it. It's a one-time thing. However, the first time that you enter First Calvary. So whenever that is for you, if it's the 5th, that's fine. If it's another Sunday, please bring that information, which will be um, stored. Um, next is entering in. You will be entered in by the direction of, uh, of our ushers. Please follow that direction. Um, families will sit together. If you're not related, you know, we will be sitting, but everyone will be socially distanced. So again, please follow the direction of uh, of our uh, usher's ministry when it comes to that. Um, we know it's a first Sunday. We will have communion. Um, the cups will be given to you at the door. So, and you will follow the direction of pastor and the deacon and deaconess um, in regards to um, communion. Dismissal. So we know we're entering one way and we're dismissing the same way. Um, we ask that when um, service is over, please follow the directions of, um, of our ushers. Um, we want it to flow. Please, no meetings, no socializing, and financialize. We would like for you to just move slowly, keep talk and walk. Um, and even when we go outside, um, if you need to speak to someone, you know, 
phone them, maybe by the car, but we really don't want any socializing. We just want it to be smooth and clean, and we just want to exit the building in a safe and oily manner. Um, offering, um, they will be taking up offering inside the sanctuary. However, many of us are given monies in various ways, um, PayPal, Tithely, those things will continue to be available to do so. As for the service itself, you'll be able to see the service um, on a various social media platforms. I do believe it's going to be live streamed. I could be wrong about that. But you will be able to see the service just like how you see it now um, on the various platforms that we have. Um, we wanted to say a shout out to the sanitation committee led by Deacon Green. The church is clean. It's been sanitized. We want to thank you for that. We also want to say thank you to the vaccination committee who has been vaccinating people within the church and the community. They will not be doing that in September, but they will resume in October. And we want to say thank you to everyone that participated um, in the reopening committee. The committee still is meeting, but we want to thank everyone for the meeting and all the work and the things that you did to order to make this reopening um, successful. Um, we ask that everyone to please be prayerful, to be patient, to be flexible, and to be understanding with all of this. Um, lastly, we want to pray for Haiti, um, that country and this devastation. Pray for them. Please pray for our troops and the country of Afghanistan. We're praying that we can get everybody out that needs to be out in a safe um, way. Um, Pray for those families that were lost. Pray for our sick and shut in and incarcerated. Um, special prayer for Sister Betty Wright that's sitting in the hospital. We want to continue to pray for the bereaved. So um, please keep Sister Scott in the loss of her mom. Um, also the family of our beloved Sister Yvette Lewis. Um, she's gone on to glory, but we want you to know that you uh, will be missed but never forgotten. And also the Sister Angela Freeman on the loss of her sister. Please pray for her. Um, and we ask that anybody that's sitting on the fence, if you have not been vaccinated, we ask that I encourage you to get your family or yourself, if you have not been vaccinated, to do so. Um, these are our notices. On any given day, a myriad of feelings from life's conundrums will overwhelm us and stress us out. But the hymnody of James Hall will help us to find solace and comfort in the message of the hymnologist. Sing them over and over again. Wonderful words of life.
A great God deserves a great prayer. We're grateful to God once again that we are here worshiping and praising and magnifying God. God has brought us eight months of the year. This is the fifth Sunday. And we thank God that next Sunday, the first Sunday of September, at 11.30, we're going to have our first in-person worship service in more than 18 months. We praise God, we magnify God, and we give him the praise. Well, today we want to deal with the fourth edition of these series of sermons on why can't we all get along. Now, we receive many positive feedbacks on these series of sermons because all of us would have to admit during these perilous times of COVID-19 and where many have been indoors with others for an extended period of time, there's, a, there's been some stress. And this idea of why can't we all get along helps us to maintain positive relationships. And so here's the fourth edition of this series of sermons, Why Can't We All Get Along? Now the text comes from Proverbs 14 and 29, and it reads as follows. People with understanding control their anger. A high temper shows great foolishness. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. Hallelujah, yes. Lord use us today in this sermon. Why can't we all get along, part four? Now, many things in life can make us angry. Relationships gone bad, crosswords between friends, difficulties with our parents, frustrations with our kids, but lingering anger usually hurts the one feeling it more than anyone else. But there is a better way because you can overcome your anger and use it positively in your life. You see, church, resolving conflict is a creative act. And there are many solutions to a single problem. The key is the willingness to seek compromise. And that is demonstrated by Connie Long, a kindergarten teacher who describes how her students started having fewer conflicts when they learned how to brainstorm solutions. She says, my kids were constantly getting into arguments over crayons, erasers, toys, and you name it. However, after introducing peacemaking skills, my students started finding ways to solve the problem instead of just getting stuck in their own positions. For example, when Ronnie and Jamie both grabbed the yellow truck, I took them aside and asked if they could come up with five ways to solve the problem. So they thought about it and they suggested taking turns, sharing or getting another truck from the toy chest or even doing another activity. They also suggested building a truck together using Legos building blocks. So the lesson here is that brainstorming has opened the children's mind to new possibilities. And if it works for the kids, it can certainly work for adults. So as we continue today, the next point for managing your anger is the solution for long-term change. Because if you want to break a lifetime habit or pattern of anger and mismanage anger, you must five, change the way you think. Tell your neighbor, change the way you think. Now the first three sermons dealt with the first four points. One, I must resolve to manage my anger. Two, I must remember the cost of uncontrolled anger. Three, I must reflect before reacting. And four, I must release my anger appropriately. And so five, change the way you think. And that feeds right into the text of the morning because what it actually does, it means that if you have an understanding of how detrimental, uncontrolled anger is in your life, you seek the wisdom to self-control because you know that anger out of control 
will cause you to do many foolish things. So Solomon's advice in Proverbs 14 and 29 is slow down. Put your brain in gear before you put your mouth in motion before you wreck your life. And so point five for managing your anger, you must change the way you think. Now Romans 12 and two helps us here when it says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see my brothers and sisters, the way you act is determined by the way you feel. And the way you feel is determined by the way you think. So if you want to change the way you feel and the way you act, you got to change how you think. Amen goes right there. So if you're acting angry, and if you're feeling angry, it's because you're thinking angry thoughts. Am I right about it? Say amen in the comment section. However, if you want to stop acting and feeling angry, to have to do some mental reconditioning. And I suggest you fill your mind with the word of God because it will help you if you memorize some verses in the Bible so God can bring them to your mind when anger starts to build up in your life. For instance, Proverbs 22 and 24 says, keep away from angry, short-tempered people or you will learn to be like them. Do you know that anger is contagious? Why, if you get around angry people, you will tend to become an angry person. Why, because it's modeled. That's why if you take a kid who's not an angry kid, and you put him in a gang of angry kids within a short period of time, he's going to be angry as well. Because if he's around angry kids, he learns to be that way. If children grow up in a home full of anger, they learn to be angry because anger is contagious. Now notice, the text says, keep away from them. And by the way, if you're dating an angry man or an angry woman or you're engaged to them, you need to break up with them until they get their anger under control and get some anger management techniques because if you hang around them too long, you're just asking for trouble. Amen goes right there. You can love a person, but it doesn't mean that you should marry them. So you have to wait until they get that area of their life under control. Notice it says, keep away from angry or tempered people, or you will learn to be like them. Now, I want you to highlight the word learn. I want you to highlight it in your mind. Learn. Why? Because this is a very important truth. Because the way you express your anger is a learned response. You don't get angry the way you do, be it a mute, a maniac, a martyr, or whatever. Just because you thought it up, somebody modeled it for you, and you learned it. All anger is a learned response. The way you express it, it was modeled for you by your parents, a brother, a sister, or somebody. A bully at school, a book you've read, movies, or magazines, or TV shows. That is why violence on TV and in the movies is such a major problem because it is modeling wrong behavior for millions of people. And the entertainment world says, you got anger, pull a gun, blow up a building, stab a guy in the back, shout and swear and kick them. And as a result, we have all kinds of crazy folk all over the land doing these copycat crimes because they've seen them done in movies. And then they turn the channel and the guy who was killed on one channel is up acting in another as if when you kill somebody, they can get back up. Uncontrolled anger is dangerous and it's learned. The good news is that since it is learned, it can also be unlearned. You don't have to stay stuck in those lousy patterns of anger that you grew up with. 
don't have to stay the same. You can change. You can learn new patterns with God's help. Now, if you're serious about changing for the better, I recommend Gregory L. Jantz's book on controlling your anger before it controls you. Now, the story is told by a guy that we'll call Bill. Listen, if you please. Bill says, I've struggled with anger and its effects all of my life. In fact, anger and rage has been part of my family for generations. Looking back, I can see how my grandfather's pattern of anger affected my father. And I can see how my father's anger influenced me and how my own inappropriate anger hurt my family. But thanks be unto God in Christ Jesus, the pattern of uncontrolled anger finally has been broken. You see, says Bill, I was the oldest of four children raised in Brooklyn, New York. And my dad was a New York City police officer. And he was my number one hero. I was always proud to see him dressed in his blue uniform with all those shiny buttons. I was in the car with him one day when he apprehended four bank robbers. But my dad had a very hard and a dark side to him. He was full of anger and rage due to the physical and emotional abuse. He saw modeled by his own father, my God who drank quite a bit. Growing up, Bill says, my dad lost control of his temper many times. I remember one time I fouled out of a baseball game and my father had jumped onto the field and before I knew it, he had the umpire pinned up against the wall. Another time in a rage, I saw him punch a hole through our bathroom wall. And rage was the normal behavior in our house. And about the time I entered high school, my folks separated and my dad's addiction to alcohol worsened. And in all of that, I continued to learn wrong ways to express my anger. One time, I was working at a pancake house on Easter Sunday when my mom was a waitress. And I was dressed as an Easter bunny. And some guy left my mom a penny tip. I became so angry that I chased him into the parking lot and threw that penny at him. Finally, Real cost of my anger caught up with me. I was expelled from high school my senior year and not allowed to return. I felt like my whole life was falling apart. And I attempted to do everything I could do to get back into school. They wouldn't let me get back in. And in an attempt to feel better, I bought a motorcycle and joined the motorcycle club. One day I was sitting in the stands looking good while inside anger and confusion in my life ate away from me. I was numbed out, confused, unguarded, and alone. Well, I finished high school at another school and soon joined the United States Marine Corps at the peak of the Vietnam War. In less than six months out of high school, I landed in Da Nang Air Base, Vietnam, scared to death, where death and human tragedy was all around us. And there we learned to push down and cover up our feelings and fears in order to cope and survive. Of course, that only made my anger grow worse. When I got out of the service, I married my high school sweetheart. And we had four beautiful children. Even marriage couldn't keep my life from unraveling. Over years, over the years, we had a number of setbacks that made me more angry. First, my dad died of alcoholism. That devastated me. Then I had a failing business, a loss of income, five IRS audits, and a lawsuit. And the more my life fell apart, the more I tried to control everyone and everything around me, I became a workaholic. So I wouldn't have to stop and feel the pain and confusion. But my rage and despair worsened, where even little things would get to me. For example, one time on a family outing, we got stuck in a giant traffic jam where 
One lane was closed off and I became impatient. So I found myself pulling out into the closed lane and I ran into an entire row of cones. I had to pull off the road to get the cones that were stuck from underneath my car. And when I got back into my car, I looked at my kids. and They were looking at me the same way I used to look at my dad when he acted out of anger. My life just fell apart. I was a living hell and I was hurting my family. Then my wife and I were invited to a church and we went. And as the preacher was preaching, I felt like he was talking just to me. So I kept going and I began to realize that the sermons and I began to go to the men's Bible studies and realize and recognize that the root cause of my anger and the turning point of my anger means that I need to turn to somebody more powerful than myself. One day, I asked Jesus to take control of my life. And it happened in one of those dark days of depression. And I heard the preacher say, do you want to turn your life over to Christ and invite Christ into your heart? And then I knew what I needed. So I dropped to my knees and prayed to receive Jesus Christ into my heart. And my burden seemed to lighten at the moment. And now Christ and I are working on my anger problems. And while it's taken me some time, I know I'm getting better. Why? Because my wife and kids are not walking on eggshells around me anymore. I'm learning to express my feelings in a loving and safe way. I'm so grateful to Jesus for the changes in my life. I'm learning to repent in my mind and release my anger in appropriate ways. I still get angry at times, but now I have Christ to help me to manage it. Instead of acting out and becoming depressed, I turn to Jesus. So if you are struggling with anger and rage, and if you are tired of hurting others and making yourself miserable, I urge you to turn your life completely over to Jesus Christ because he understands, he loves you, and he will help you to change the way you think. So as I rush to my close, there's a sixth key to anger management. Tell your neighbor, rely on God's control. Tell your neighbor again, rely on God's control. You see, Bill learned this lesson, and that is, you're not going to get any better on your own, because if you are honest, you would have to admit that you've already tried that, and you know it doesn't work, because there's no way you can change a lifelong pattern of inappropriate anger just by saying, I'm going to do it on my own. You need God's help, sister. You must rely on God's help, my brother. Colossians 3.15 says that the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Now, here's the real secret. Don't miss this, because God's power to change you is when you get the peace of Christ in your heart to replace the anger in your heart. Amen goes right there. God's power to change you is when you get the peace of Christ in your heart to replace the anger in your heart. Hallelujah, yes. You see, church, your relationship with Christ will determine how patient you are. And if you have a very close relationship with Christ and you depend on him, you be controlled in him and you'll find that you're a lot more patient. However, if you just have a casual relationship with Christ, or if you're just a fringe Christian, you leave yourself open to anger and impatience. You see, the more Christ controls your life, the more patient you will be. But how does God help me to manage my anger? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, because God does it, by dealing with the root issues of frustration, fear, and hurt in your life. The Bible says this 
in Matthew 12, 34. Whatever is in your heart determines what you say. The Bible teaches that the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. When it comes to anger, the heart of the issue is the issue of the heart. The problem is not really my mouth. The problem is my heart. You see, my heart betrays what's inside of me. Have you ever said to somebody you love, you say something not nice to somebody you love, and you say, I don't know what got into me, because that's not me. But oh yes, yes, it's just like you, because whatever comes out of the mouth is what's in the heart. Your problem is a heart problem. You have a sarcastic mouth. You're revealing an angry heart. If you have a judgmental mouth, you're revealing a guilty heart. Why? Because what's inside of you is what's going to come out of you. If you have an overactive mouth, you're revealing a heart that's just not at peace, a heart that's confused and disturbed. If you have a negative mouth, you're revealing a fearful heart. If you have a critical mouth, and you're always criticizing people, you're revealing that you have a bitter heart because what's inside of you is what's gonna come out. And if you have a boasting mouth, and you're always bragging on yourself, you're revealing an insecure heart. And if you have a filthy mouth, and you're always spewing vulgar cuss words and profanities, you're revealing an impure heart. Because rest assured, what's inside is going to come out. On the other hand, if you have an encouraging mouth, and you're always encouraging other people, you're revealing a happy heart. And if you have a gentle mouth, and you're always saying words in gentleness. You're revealing a loving heart. And if you have a controlled mouth, and you don't feel like you ought to talk all the time, you're revealing a heart at peace. You see, what really is needed in anger management is a heart transplant. You need a new heart. And just so happen, I know where you can find one. His name is Jesus Christ. He specializes in heart transplants. He specializes in making ways out of no ways. You see, church, all the therapy and all the self-help books and all the positive tapes in the world cannot give you a new heart because only Jesus Christ can do that. The Bible says when anyone becomes a new Christian, in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, they become a new person inside. They get a new heart. The old has passed away and the new has come. David said, create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit unto me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. That's what we all need to pray for today. Jesus Christ can deal with the root cause and issues of your anger. And he can replace your frustrated heart with one filled with love. Why not place him in control of your life? Then you have the peace that passes all understanding. He can replace your hurting heart with his loving heart. Why you may have been rejected as a child, you may have been rejected as an adult, you may have been abandoned, you may have been abused, you may have felt unloved, you may have felt lonely at times, but God sees your pain. And no one in the whole world cares more about you than Jesus Christ. Your pain matters to God. You matter to God. He can replace the hurt in your heart, the stuff that you have been denying and pushing down. He'll replace it with genuine love. Jesus can replace 
your insecurity. Jesus can replace your fears. Jesus can calm your anxieties. Jesus can give you peace and he can give you power. You just got to claim it. Do you hear what I said? Claim the peace of Jesus. Give your life to Christ. And tell God, I can't handle this anger issues on my own. I need you, Lord, to step in and to handle these issues in my life. Well, if you claim it, he'll fix it for you. Tell your neighbor, if you claim it, really mean it. He will fix it for you. And he fixed it for all of us. One day on a hilltop called Calvary, we died that we might live. And got up three days later on resurrection morn with all power in his hands. He fixed it for us and promised us everlasting life. Not only fixing it for us now, but fixing it for us from now until eternity. I invite you to give your life to Christ. The doors of the church is open. Come by letter, candidate for baptism, or on Christian experience. Jesus is calling. The doors of the church is open. And I hear Jesus tell me, if you hear my voice, hard not your heart, and behold, I stand at the door of the heart and knock. And if any man hear my voice, and open the door. I'll come in and sup with him and be with me. Jesus is calling. And if you feel moved with the Spirit, if you have been listening to these words and you feel that God is talking to you, and he is, I invite you to call 718-453-1278. Tell Deaconess Kareem Griffin, I want to join the church and tell God, put my name on the Lamb's Book of Life. He'll give you a homeowner. You're going to be an inheritor of a place in the sky. Amen. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Only what you do for him will be counted in the end. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, more so now than any other time, we need your help. We're asking that our members, we're asking that our friends would donate. Members, we're asking for your time. Members, we're asking that you be faithful in your giving now more than any other time. We're getting ready to go back into our church house and we need your support. Please, sir, please, ma'am, we got four ways. We got four ways prescribed that you might be able to support this, your church. We ask that you would do your level best. Don't wait till tomorrow. I know some of us say, well, I'll do it tomorrow, but tomorrow you forget about it, and tomorrow may be too late. Get to your church now while you have the time. Amen. And now, may the grace of our Father, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest through the Bible with these die your people, both now and evermore. The people of God said, Amen, and Amen, and Amen. I love you, and you can't do a thing without me. Have a marvelous day. Take Jesus with you. And don't forget the family prayer for Jesus. We'll meet you there.